Thank you for tuning in to the Voice of the Victim podcast. We discuss a lot of sad and potentially triggering things on this show. We try to be as sensitive and cautious as possible, but if you are sensitive to things involving abuse and may be triggered, please think twice before listening to our show. There are over 700,000 sexual offenders in the United States alone. With all the social media these days, how can we protect ourselves and our children from these despicable predators? Welcome to the Voice of the Victim podcast, where we discuss criminal cases that involve some factor of abuse. Our goal is to spread awareness of abuse that could be taking place around any of us and encourage everyone to take responsibility and report if they see a child or an adult being abused. On June 5th, 2002, Brian David Mitchell made his way into the home of the Smart family around 2 a.m. He had done some work on their property seven months earlier after Lois Smart had given him some money and her husband's phone number for some work after she'd seen him begging on the street in downtown Salt Lake City. While he was there, he noticed the young girl, Elizabeth Smart. She was only 14. From that point on, she was his target, and he was going to find a way to get to her. After cutting open the screen on the kitchen window, he crawled in and walked to Elizabeth's bedroom. He held the knife to her and told her to keep quiet and follow him. She would endure a nightmare of living with him for almost a year while her parents searched for her. She was afraid to run or call for help because Brian made her believe people were working for him and had threatened the lives of her family. But on March 12, 2003, she was finally found and Brian David Mitchell was taken into police custody. Welcome to the Voice of the Victim podcast. I'm Rosie. And I'm Ryan. And this is part two of our coverage of Elizabeth Smart. So if you haven't heard part one, be sure to listen to that first. Yes, and we also want to say thank you so much to our new patron, Eli. Um, We really appreciate your support and your kind words so much. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that was really cool. Did that happen when we woke up? Did we notice that? Or was that right before we went to bed that we noticed? It was right before we recorded last week's episode. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. So We got another new one that we're waiting to hear back from, but... Like I said last week, if if you have become a patron and you're still waiting for your shout out, please let us know because, um, yeah, we've been getting a lot more support than we've been used to, and it's been so cool. Mm-hmm. But we're also still learning how to manage it. So, <laughs> so yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're continuing our discussion this week about Elizabeth Smart's case, and we're going to be focusing more on Brian Mitchell and his life. Um, of course, we know he's the idiot that put Elizabeth through all these horrible things, but we're going to be talking a little bit about who he was and who his family knew him as before all of this happened. So, so Brian was born on October 18th, 1953 in Salt Lake City, Utah. He was raised by strict Mormon parents, Cheryl and I, is it Cheryl? Yeah, I believe so. Okay, Cheryl and Irene Mitchell, along with five other siblings. When Brian was eight years old, his parents caught him playing doctor. So to deal with that, his father, Cheryl, showed him colored pictures of genitalia from a medical handbook at age eight. I mean, this seems a little strange. It's, I mean, it's important to educate our children about sex as soon as we can for their own protection, I think. But showing an eight-year-old pictures of actual genitalia is not sex education. But that's a discussion for a different time. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't think an eight-year-old should call genitalia like wee-wee <laughs> anymore. Well, but at the same time, I don't think just flat out, boom, here you go handouts well yeah and it needs to be like described like yeah this is how you this is what to expect and this is how to deal with it not yeah. here's pictures of a vagina you might see one of these someday <laughs> yeah you know thank you apparently when brian was nine years old he had done something to upset his father whose name was cheryl mitchell 
and to teach him a lesson, Cheryl put his nine-year-old son in the car and drove him out to the middle of nowhere. He made Brian get out of the car and drove off, making him find his own way home. So, I don't mean to play devil's advocate here, but this is some terrible parenting. I mean, what if nine-year-old Brian would have been taken? I'd say that this qualifies as some form of abuse and could have definitely had an impact on the way Brian turned out. What if Brian wasn't able to make it back home? Yeah, I wouldn't have been able to. I know, nine years old. I mean... That's rough. Yeah, you you probably still wouldn't be able to find your way home <laughs> if I dropped you off in the woods somewhere. No, I wouldn't. So. Apparently, Brian decided to stay away from home all day and make his parents worry about him. So he found a place in town and just waited for the day. So it seems like he was just following the example of his father. It's a kind of I'll show you attitude that both Cheryl and Brian used in this situation. It's not an advisable path to take if you want a healthy relationship with your children or anyone. Brian's parents also seemed to blame him for a lot of conflict in the household. His father said during the trial that Brian is a very intelligent person, and he used that to his full advantage in harassment of the other children and his own mother. So based on this parenting style, I wonder how much of that is nature and how much is nurture. Because as we talked about last week, um, Brian would never really submit to a psychiatric evaluation, would he? No, but he refused. I think he doesn't want people to realize that he actually is sane. Hmm. And because, I mean, based on a lot of things he did, I think he was forcefully evaluated and they concluded that he was sane. And that's why he, um, that came into play during the trial. But I think we'll talk about that later, so. At age 16, he had a run-in with the law after he had allegedly exposed himself to an 8-year-old girl and asked her to touch him. Her father pressed charges against him and brought him to juvenile court. Later that year, Brian had been constantly arguing with his mother, which culminated in Brian shoving his mother Irene, so they sent him away to live with his now grandmother for three year months. And when we say shoving his mother, um, based on... Some of the wording in the movie, it sounds like he threw his mother down the stairs. I didn't mean now grandmother, I just meant grandmother. Yeah, I, I think people got it. Okay. <laughs> but with all this stuff about Brian's past, um, this was all from his father's court testimony, what we've just shared. His mother actually claimed to have no recollection of Brian's arrest or sending him away. Hmm. But it's kind of strange because of other things she did testify about. That's weird. What mom would forget those details? Well, I don't know. Maybe a mom that just wants her son to be normal? His mother told the court about an incident about two months before Brian's arrest for kidnapping Elizabeth, where he showed up to her house with his wife Wanda, demanding that Irene read his book of Emmanuel David Isaiah. He was pretty aggressive while doing this, and this led to his mother taking out a restraining order against him. So this book of Emmanuel Dave, well, here's how he pronounced it. Emmanuel David Isaiah is a book that Brian himself had written. To give you an idea of what he was writing, I'm going to read just the first few sentences of his book. Oh, I'm excited. And keep in mind, this was in 2002. Do you know how long it was? I think it was like 20 pages or something. Oh. Um, okay, so, quote, Hearken, O ye inhabitants of the earth, listen together and open your ears, for it is I, the Lord God of all the earth, the creator of all things, that speaketh unto you. Yeah, even Jesus Christ, speaking by the voice of my servant, whom I have called and chosen to be a light and a covenant to the world in these last days. So I'm not going to waste any more time reading this crap, but um, we want to remember that the terrible things that he put Elizabeth Smart through and not focus too much on his mm -hmm. stupid crap. But, but we just want to give you an idea of where this guy was mentally. And I th is it just me or does the dialect of his writing seem to change just throughout those <laughs> first mean, couple? Hirkin and then yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, like Y-E-A. Like people, what is? I've never heard the word hearken before. 
Me neither. I think it's like here, Ken. I mean, he's talking to <laughs> okay. Ken. Here, Ken. H e h h e a r k e n. So Ken. he's talking to Ken. Okay. Okay. Basically, his book was about how modern churches today are lacking truth and authority, and that God had chosen Emmanuel, aka Brian Mitchell, as a prophet to be a light in the darkness and gather people into the true and living church. It also had instructions for Brian to marry seven more wives. Uh, this sounds to me like an aspiring cult leader. Also, we forgot to mention that he'd been excommunicated from the Mormon church at the point where he had written this book, which he actually had a pretty big role in the church at some point. In his book, he denounces, you mean denounces? Yes, sorry. He denounces the LDS Mormon church as false prophets who speak vain and foolish and lying words. It's a really wordy way to put it. You know... When someone puts two ands in a row, that they're just really excited and proud about what they're writing. <laughs> this guy was clearly in a strange place mentally and spiritually. They used this book as a way to determine Brian's sanity during the trial. Mitchell was originally found unfit to stand trial by reason of insanity. But after an evaluation by Dr. Michael Wellner, he was found fit to stand trial, which led him getting his life sentence. So back to his mother's testimony, she said that he was really into healthy eating, but prosecutors pointed out that he also used drugs and alcohol heavily. Yeah, I mean, this is interesting because depending on the amount of alcohol which, um, that you take and which drugs you're taking, it could be considered part of a healthy lifestyle in proper legal moderation, but... Uh, it sounds like this guy was going overboard with it, and he's also smoking cigarettes, so take that how you will. So Wanda was actually Brian's third wife. He had been married to two other women. His first wife, Karen, was only 15 to 16 when she mar married Brian, who was only 19 at the time. They were partiers, like most teenagers are. Yeah, and that's understandable, but... The problem here is that they had already given birth to two children, Travis and Angie. Ooh, that's young. And Brian's sister had said that they were not great parents to them. How could they be? That means that she was probably like 14 when they had them. Well, I think they had them after they were married. But Oh, I thought you meant before. Okay, got it. Brian and Karen eventually got a divorce, and Brian was worried about losing custody of his two children. But instead of making a case for his parenthood, or trying to work out a balanced schedule with Karen, he took his two kids and fled to New Hampshire the day the custody hearing was scheduled. So it doesn't sound like he had very high hopes of actually getting custody of his children, and he's also setting a precedent here of the way he likes to handle problems, which is his own way. Mm -hmm. Not following Taking anyone else's. I'm sorry? Taking and running? Yeah. He went to great lengths to avoid getting caught with his children. He would write letters to his mom and sisters with pictures of the children, but ask them to keep the letters and pictures hidden from authorities, and especially from his ex-wife Karen. He feared that if she saw the pictures, she'd become even more determined to find them. Mm-hmm. So... Like I said, Elizabeth Smart was not his first kidnapping victim. He grew his hair and beard out while in New Hampshire and joined a hair Krishna. Hari Krishna. Hari Krishna, not a hair. Like a rabbit. <laughs> Whoa, the cat's just had a spaz attack. Okay. Okay, so he joined a Hari Krishna com commune. He told his mother it was all part of his new act and apologized for not looking like a sweet little boy all the time. He admitted he only joined the Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna for survival because it was a place to live and get food and water. Don't you recognize that from I Am the Walrus? John Lennon talks about Hare Krishna. Mm -mm. Okay. Well, anyway, it seems like Brian got sick of this quote unquote act because he eventually returned to Utah. When he first returned, people described him as dark and appeared to be pretty unhealthy abusing alcohol and drugs. After all this, his brother had returned from the LDS mission and somehow was able to get Brian involved in the church again. 
so he cut his hair and cleaned up his act. For those who don't know, the LDS Church, a.k.a. the Church of Latter-day Saints, is the Mormon Church. So, Once he got back into the Mormon lifestyle, he met his second wife, Debbie, at a singles dance. They were both pretty dysfunctional at the time, and the marriage didn't last long. During this marriage, they had two children. Debbie alleged that during their marriage, Brian was physically abusive to her and sexually abusive to the four children, even their 18-month-old. Mm. Yuck. Yeah, so we can see he was never really a great guy. I mean, he, at 16 years old, tried to tried to have sexual contact with an 8-year-old, which reminds me of... Um, one of the personal stories we've shared on this show, and I don't want to compare it to the, the person and give her, like, put her on the spot, but if you go back and listen to our older episodes, you'll probably know what I'm talking about. Um, but she later said she had gone to the LDS church officials for help, but they just laughed at her assertions and did nothing. She would show up to the church with black eyes and the officials would ask her what she had done to make him hit her. Oh, that is, like, so upsetting. So sexist and old school and just enraging. Then they would tell her that if she needed to work on her marriage and couldn't escape from it. Now, she really wants Brian to apologize for what he had done to her and her children, especially since he never had been prosecuted for the crimes. Yeah, this, I mean, right here is such a huge missed opportunity because if he was abusing his wife and children, he should have gotten in trouble at this point for it. Definitely. Yeah. But she wrote to Brian um, saying, you were the father of our children in our home and your children were robbed of that safety time and time again. And you are now convicted of what you did to Elizabeth and there is closure for her. But there is no closure for us. Aww. So, like I said, this seems like a huge missed opportunity to me to get Brian the help he should have gotten before he got to a point where he would kidnap another young girl. Mm -hmm. I can't believe the reaction of the LDS church officials to her allegations. At the time, she trusted them, and they should have called the police and gotten an investigation started. But unfortunately... The clergy is protected by the priest's penitent privilege, which is kind of like attorney-client privilege, where they're not allowed to disclose information to authorities that has been confessed to them um, in secret. And this also applies to illegal activity and allegations, which seems really s sketchy to me. But I wonder why Debbie didn't involve the police here. But again, she's an, also an abuse victim, and we can't blame her for how she handled it. While married to Debbie, Brian ended up placing his two children from his first marriage, which he fought so hard to keep, into foster care. He was convinced that they were threatening his marriage to Debbie. I'm wondering where the mother Karen was at this time, and if he had ever gotten in trouble for skipping the court hearing and fleeing in the first place. This guy seems to be just getting away with so much crap, which was all leading up to the crimes against the Smart family. It's all really strange. When Brian and Debbie would attend the church, he'd leave their children at home, telling them they weren't worthy to be baptized. He subjected them to isolation, telling them they were unworthy of speaking to anyone in their lives, from family, neighbors, church members, or even other school children. That's got to be really disheartening to have your father tell you you're not worthy of talking to anyone else. So Debbie was finally able to divorce Brian and escape the abusive relationship. When his two children from his first marriage were finally adopted, Brian stipulated they must be placed in a non-LDS family and not be allowed to have contact with their extended family. But once the children were in high school, they ran away to return to their biological mother, Karen. Thank goodness. Oh, what a freak. I know. Control, like you were talking about last week. Mm -hmm. This control over other people is so important to him. Mm -hmm. uh, when he went to place his two original children in foster care um, initially, 
he was required to get a mental health evaluation, and they found no sign of mental illness at that time. So remember how we'd uh, he'd mentioned to his mom that the Hare Krishna was all part of an act? It seems like he spent a lot of his life, quote-unquote, acting. I wonder if his book was part of an act to come across as insane while he was plotting to kidnap Elizabeth, because really seems like he always knew better, but he just was a complete jerk. Huh. I don't know. That's it. That is something to think about. Because he wrote it. He Well, he finished writing it two months before the um, kidnapping of Elizabeth, which he had been planning for seven months. So mm -hmm. who knows? Hmm. Around this time, Brian started acting like he was superior to the others in his family. He acted like he knew special things that other people don't know. These kind of people rub me the wrong way. It might be because I feel the complete opposite of this in my life. Like, everyone else knows something I don't know. But I gotta be blunt. If you think you have everything figured out, you're a fool. I hope that doesn't rub anyone the wrong way, but life is a constant learning experience. And if you're not willing to admit that, you're probably going to be lonely and unsuccessful. Or in Brian's case, imprisoned for life. <laughs> but I like that. <laughs> and then again, certain recent world events completely contradict what I just said. So what do I know? <laughs> I like what you said. <laughs> if you think you know anything, everything, you're going to be lonely or in jail. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually, Brian married Wanda Barzi, his final marriage. Well, his final marriage in the law, right? Yes. Wanda Barzi had six children with her previous marriage that she brought with her into the marriage to Brian. In the time leading up to Elizabeth's kidnapping, when people would see Wanda and Brian around the town, they were wearing their white robes and pushing a covered wagon handcart. Classy. <laughs> it's not a station wagon. It's a wagon handcart. <laughs> I would like one of those. That'd be kind of cool. Mm, okay. They would visit the Salvation Army for food, but other people around the shelter would keep their distance from the couple because they were standoffish and preachy. Yeah, apparently, according to people, you couldn't have a conversation with this guy without him preaching to you condescendingly. Not very popular around the homeless people. But we mentioned Wanda had six children. Four of them actually made an appearance on Oprah to talk about their mother, Wanda. Rhonda, Andrea, Derek, and Lori went on Oprah to speak out about life with Rhonda growing up. Her daughter, Andrea, said, I think the media portrayed my mother as being a victim of Brian David Mitchell, and I think one of the reasons I wanted to come on the show is to kind of expose her for the monster she is, Andrea says. She would brainwash us relentlessly, we would be called up to her room, and she would sit there and drum into us. If you weren't part of this family, then the family would be fine. So it was more the psychological, emotional constant abuse from her that, to me, was worse than the physical abuse. Because I felt like the physical wounds could always heal, but the scars of the emotional abuse have remained. Ugh. So, yeah, Wanda is not innocent in this. Right. Derek told Oprah that he was never taught the difference between right and wrong. He had gotten in trouble with the law often. He said, I wanted nurturing so badly. I wanted my parents to love me, you know. I wanted somebody to tell me it was all right. I never got that. And emotional neglect is a form of child abuse that is often overlooked, but it can be so damaging. Children need that nurturing, especially during their formative and developmental years. Wanda was extremely strict with her children, punishing them with beatings any time they did anything that was slightly out of line. Andrea said she never knew what a normal family behaved like until she went over to a friend's house. She would actually ask her friend, You mean, your parents don't beat you? That is so freaking sad. She had actually gone on a camping trip with this friend and said it was like heaven being away from home for two weeks. 
Like we mentioned before with Elizabeth, home is a place where you're supposed to feel safe and welcome, but these poor kids were always walking on eggshells. Their biological father was also abusive to them, and they thought maybe Wanda was afraid of him and his wrath if she ever tried to defend them. Both of the parents would beat them. This makes me wonder if their father was physically abusive to Wanda as well. I mean, we see all too often that abuse is a cycle. Abusers had often been abused themselves. And this is why it's so important for us to spread this awareness of abuse and try to help give people tools and knowledge to use to protect themselves. If we can help just one person avoid abuse and break that cycle, it's all worth it. But my point is, who knows how much Wanda's first husband had abused her and kind of made her lose it. So in 1984, Wanda divorced her first husband, and within a year, she married Brian David Mitchell. Rhonda had a bad feeling about Brian. He had hugged Rhonda, and it gave her a really creepy feeling. Wanda and Brian would force Lori, who was 12, when she moved in with them, to pray with them for two to four hours a day. Yeah, apparently Brian didn't want any of the kids moving in with them, but the youngest daughter, Lori, did move in with them for a little while. Like, Brian made uh, Wanda sign her kids away to marry him. And there was a time when Wanda was praying and Lori was kneeling next to her, and Brian, like, nudged uh, Lori while Wanda was praying with her eyes shut and pulled out some porno photos and laid them on the bed in front of Lori. And this is vaguely reminiscent of the way Brian's father had given him, quote-unquote, sex ed. Hmm, that's very odd. I know. Despite this incident, Brian never sexually abused Lori, but he would give her long hugs, brush up against her, and stare at her. She felt like he was undressing her with his eyes. The straw that broke the camel's back for Lori was the day that Wanda told her that they were having chicken for dinner. Wanda and Brian didn't eat much of the chicken, but just picked at their salads, grinning in a devious way. The next day, Lori went to feed her pet bunny, Peaches, but she wasn't in her cage. Lori asked her mom where her bunny was, and Wanda replied, You had her for dinner last night. This is some sick and twisted mental torment. This is like, who does that? What mom would do that to their kid? Psychos. She is seriously, um, I think, I don't think Brian is psychologically... That's so Um, sad. You know, insane, but I think Wanda really is insane. And Peaches. I mean, obviously I'm no professional, but even her kids seem to think she's insane, which we'll talk about. But this, (laughs) you just keep saying poor Peaches. This event is what led to Lori eventually moving out of the home because she was... I don't blame her. I would too. Yeah. I mean, like you said, who does that? Eventually, Wanda abandoned and disowned them. They only saw her in passing around town once in a while. In 1991, Wanda and Brian sold all their possessions and were living a life of poverty to get closer to God. Derek and Rhonda both learned that Brian Mitchell was a suspect of Elizabeth's kidnapping on America's Most Wanted. Like we talked about last week. As soon as they saw it, everything clicked with them, and they were sure he did it and that their mother was also involved. Mm -hmm. And so they had called the authorities, let them know his real identity, and sent in photos of him. And they believed the couple was very power-hungry and wanted control over something. They think Elizabeth was their first recruit to start their own cult, actually. And this makes sense to me, especially since all their own children had left them They didn't have anyone to exercise that power and control over, which, as we talked about a lot a couple weeks ago, is the founding basis for a lot of abuse, this power over somebody. For their entire childhood, they all knew their mother was sick, but it was a taboo topic in their household. Can I just say, I hate taboos. I hate the word taboos. Mm -hmm. They've been the cause of so many horrible things. People need to talk about stuff, even if it's difficult. Communication is the most important part of a human relationship, and 
at least in my mind. I mean, there's a need for taboos when it comes to certain things. Like, I don't think it's okay to make jokes about victimizing other people, but in situations like that, taboos are fine. But when it comes to a mental illness that's victimizing other people, it needs to be acknowledged before someone gets kidnapped and abused, or even worse. This life experience has led Lori to learn a lot about mental disorders and to use her childhood trauma to better herself. Mm -hmm. And if anyone felt like Derek was blaming his mother for his illegal activity, he said on the show that he's learned to take responsibility for himself. He's acknowledged he was on the wrong path, and he had to own up to his own mistakes. That's what's helped him heal and to stop feeling like a victim of his own circumstance. And his childhood was definitely a mitigating factor in his behavior, but ultimately, he owned his own actions, and I think that's such a great example for everybody. Lori actually provided testimony in the trial of Brian Mitchell, along with Heidi Woodridge, his second wife Debbie's daughter. In the trial, Lori testified that Brian wanted to be more powerful than anything else. He wanted to be godlike. And we see that with his moronic book of Emmanuel David Isaiah, or whatever it was called. She said he was extremely controlling and didn't seem mentally ill. He was just a controlling jerk. She talked about some nights when she'd hear her mother scream out in the middle of the night. She was afraid to go see what it was, but it sounded like he was overpowering her. Wanda made Lori get a job and would take all the money from her but she wasn't allowed to use the phone or go to friends' houses, or even to have friends over. She could only leave for church and work. She said they were greedy and always wanted more. So this is obviously before they sold off everything and started to live in poverty. But, man, can you imagine only being able to leave for work and church? Well, what a boring life. I know, it'd be so sad not to have your friends over. <sighs> Lori said that Brian was always touching either her or Wanda, trying to show his dominance over them, inappropriately touching his stepdaughter. But she feared him and didn't want to get him angry if she fought it. On her 14th birthday, they actually allowed her to have friends over to watch the movie Grease. Brian found the movie objectionable and threw everyone out of the house. So Lori plotted with her friends and filled paper bags with poop, peanut butter, and syrup and bombed her own home. <laughs> That's <laughs> I mean, pretty funny. You get to a point when you're so suppressed that you just break when you're a child. I mean, you, a child can't live in a house that's so suppressive like this. Mm -hmm. but, but we're giving a lot of kids, if there's any teenagers listening, some good ideas. Well, wow. That was poop, peanut butter, and syrup. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got to do what you got to do. But right after this incident was when they fed her peaches, her oh. pet bunny, and she decided to leave. So that was their revenge on her after she... That's so sad. ...did this. How could you, like, kill a pet bunny? Like, how demonic do you have to be to kill a bunny? <laughs> well, let's not drag the demons into this. Lori acknowledged that Brian Mitchell was very conscious of his appearance when he went out in public. She said... He would present himself in whatever form he wanted everyone to see him. This speaks again to his acting hobby. He did whatever he had to do to get what he wanted. He would read books about Jeffrey Dahmer, survival, and how to dominate people. Now, we can't judge him for reading books about survival or Jeffrey Dahmer, because in the true crime community, we've probably all listened to his story in a podcast, and what's the difference? But... Dominating other people is something I personally don't understand. I wonder what douchebags wrote the books he was reading. Lori said he was obsessed with dominating other people and using them as his puppets. He was the classic example of acting one way in church and completely different when he got home. Hashtag pet peeve. I mean, don't get me wrong. We've all done this to an extent. Obviously, when you're in a place of worship, you'll be a little bit extra respectful and kind and smiley. But an absolute shift in personality and morals is a different story. It's like that Melanie Martinez song, Dollhouse. Oh, love that song. <laughs> Everyone thinks that we're perfect. Please don't let them look through the curtains. Are you going to sing it? 
D O L L H O U S C. I see some. Wait, no. I see things that nobody else sees. I feel like I'm doing a little bit of a. You changed key. Yeah. But okay. <laughs> Sorry, song. you had to hear that. Um, that's a great song, though. It's got a really good point about people putting on appearances, and it is an issue that's out there. Lori said it was a complete 180. She actually liked the person he was in church, but at home it was nothing but torment and chaos. He could never get enough power. Just before she left is when he started referring to himself as a prophet, which led to his book. A true masterpiece. Not. I don't want to recommend you go read it, but it is out there if you really want to. Like, it's out there on websites that you can look up? Yeah, if you look up Book of Emmanuel, David Mitchell, or no, Isaiah. It's out there. Hmm. Heidi, Debbie's daughter, had a more brief testimony. She was timid and nervous, wiping away tears as she discussed the abuse that she suffered from ages 9 to 12. It seems like Debbie's kids, his middle wife, really got the brunt of his abuse. One day, she had been taking a bath when she heard something in the linen closet. She looked, and Brian was in there, taking pictures of her in the bath. So he's also producing child porn? That's disgusting. Another time, Heidi heard Brian and Debbie screaming at each other. She went into the kitchen and saw that Brian had put dead mice inside the burners of the stove. And Debbie was terrified of mice. So he was clearly doing this to torture her. You don't have to be terrified of mice for that to be torture. That's just disgusting. Yeah, even if you're not scared of mice, that's a huge... Like, if Gordon Ramsay saw that, he would Gordon flip Ramsay. out. Yeah, or if anybody saw that, they'd flip out. Yeah, it's disgusting, like you said. But we see this guy is just a total creep, and he always had been. So after all this, we have a clear picture of exactly who this guy was that put Elizabeth Smart through such terrible things. Sadly, she wasn't his only victim, but hopefully she will be the last. Ugh. So we just see so many missed opportunities throughout his life, especially with his second wife, Debbie, going to the church officials and and telling them that he was being hurt. And yeah, I know they have to follow that stupid law, but ugh, it's ridiculous. Well, they that... could have helped her instead of saying, what are you doing to make him hit you? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's wrong. Ugh. Huh. But we know last week's episode was really long, but there was there's just so many details available about this case and it's a really it's a really interesting and crazy yeah, story, so we didn't want to leave anything out. Mhm. Um but we want to thank you guys for all your feedback on our latest Instagram post about length. <laughs> it seems like the average answer was like between a half hour to an hour. Yeah. And I like the answer of the, if the content's interesting, it doesn't matter how long it is. Mm-hmm. I agree because I work a job where I listen to podcasts all day. And if it, even if it's like four hours long, if it's really interesting, I enjoy it. That's but a pretty long podcast. I would never produce a podcast that long. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, do we have any updates on the cats? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Like I say every week, um, if you listen to this point and you don't want to hear us talk about our lives or our cats, feel free to leave. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at VOV Pod, Instagram at VOV Podcast, Facebook, the Voice of the Victim Podcast, or Voice of the Victim Support System. Or you can email us at vovpodcast at gmail dot com. Mm-hmm. And oh. please check out our Patreon page. We still have a box of cool stuff that we'd like to ship out to you. Yeah, um, we're super psyched about our new patrons, and we thank you so much for choosing our podcast to support. Yeah, thank you guys. And we're always have our arms open for more new Patreon family members. So yeah. please check it out. Support us if you want. Did we thank Eli? At yeah, the beginning? we did. Okay, yeah. Bad memory. Yep. <laughs> and like Ryan said in the beginning, if you haven't gotten your shout-out, 
check your Patreon messages because we do message everybody, but I think it's, it's, you know, it's not like we're people use the Patreon messaging app that often. Yeah. Exactly. So just, you know, log in there really quick and answer us. And if you want to shout out, great. If you don't, okay. Not a big problem. Not a deal. Not a problem. I mean, you want, I can't believe all the support we've been getting because I, uh, a couple of days ago went back and listened to a few of our first episodes, like, up till episode 10, I think. and They're embarrassing. I, I don't could even not like even to. make it through one. Yeah, I don't like, like to listen to them. We definitely don't recommend you listen to any episodes like before 10. 10, for sure. <laughs> because, but apparently some people are, are hearing them and still listening to us because they, they've been saying they've binged our, all of our episodes yeah. and they want more. We've gotten some really nice reviews. We love reviews that are nice. Yeah, thank you guys so much. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been going pretty well. Yeah. We just got some plane tickets. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and... Rip off. Oh, yeah, but the cats are good. That's about it. Yep. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, we thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next week. All right. Bye. Bye. Go check out the Murderific Podcast. That's Murderific. Available today at the website Murderific.com. Also on Podbean. The Murderific Podcast is just a girl from the scary state of Maine with a serious love of true crime. This podcast is about serial killers, mass murderers, familicides, and more. Stream today at Murderific.com. M-U-R-D-E-R-I-F-I-C. Murderific.com. You can also follow the show on Instagram at Murderific Podcast. The Murderific Podcast at Murderific.com, also available on Podbean, executing podcasts one crime at a time. Go check it out now.